Our passage this morning is from Philippians chapter 2, from verses 19 through to 30. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by the news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because he heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. That is God's word for us today. Well, thank you, uh, Unime. Thank you, worship team, for uh, leading us to the throne this morning. Really appreciate, uh, really appreciate that encouragement and the focus on uh, on Christ. Well, good morning. My name's Dave. Dave Kirk, I'm one of the uh, pastors here at Grace. I am the pastor over spiritual formation, and it is good to be with you this morning. Uh, normally when Brooks is teaching, I'm teaching in other parts of the building, and uh, so you don't get to hear from me much up here, but uh, I'm excited today to, uh, to bring the word. And uh, as Zach mentioned, we're going to be talking about equipping the next generation this morning, so I'm excited to do that. Um, if you're new with us, Welcome. We have been studying the book of Philippians uh, here for the fa- last number of weeks since Christmas, and uh, we, I have thoroughly enjoyed our time in the book of Philippians as we're looking to see what our identity is. And also, if you notice, if you spend any time in Philippians at all, uh, Paul does an amazing job of pointing out that we can have contentment, contentment and joy even in the face of suffering. And some of the most powerful words that are spoken are spoken in Philippians about who God is. And I pray that the book of Philippians has been an encouragement to your heart as well. Um, We're going to be in chapter 2 today. The last couple weeks, uh, Jason talked uh, two weeks ago about um, having unity in Christ. And part of what that unity in Christ looks like is walking in humility before the Lord and with one another. And to follow the example that Christ gave as he came in humility and and took on human form and how he went to the cross and was crucified and died and buried and rose again to save us from our sins and uh, that he is seen as the servant and uh, that that's what uh, that that's what we should imitate and that's what we should follow so last week Paul brought the message he did a great job Uh, talked to us about what does it look like to work out our salvation with fear and trembling so that we shine like stars in the universe And so today, uh, we're going to pick up and we're going to close in chapter 2. Now, here's the thing. This seems like a break in in, in Paul's train of thought. And in some ways, it is. He moves from writing a letter to giving us a narrative. And I don't know about you, but this happens a lot in Paul's epistles. Uh, Normally, he will start with a big corporate prayer for the congregation that he's writing to or to all Christians Uh, blessing them, encouraging them, and then praying for them to experience the faithfulness of God in a way that helps them to move forward to spiritual maturity and to make disciples who make disciples. So normally we get that on the front end of every letter that Paul writes. Sometimes it's at the back. But one of the things that always shows up in the back is Paul's always greeting his friends. You ever notice that? You know, and we oftentimes read that and we're like, okay, that's just filler. Uh, Let's move on to the next thing. I just want you to know that every word in the scripture 
It's not filler. It's there by design. God has something he wants us to learn and know. Even when it's tracking some of these names of people we can't even begin to pronounce, right? Epaphroditus might be one such name today. And you might hear me say it a numerous times. And that's why I got water up here because I'm guaranteed to get tongue twisted saying Epaphroditus, all right? But Paul isn't just saying hey to his friends. What Paul's doing there is really instructive for us because he is showing that the Great Commission, the call to love God with all of our hearts and to love others as ourselves, the call to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and to make disciples, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded, is not just an individual mission. It's a group mission. It's a family mission. And so when Paul greets these people all along the way, These men and women are men and women who have been faithful to the gospel and faithful in disciple making and who have walked alongside Paul uh, so that the mission uh, could be successful. So why is it then that right here smack dab at the end of chapter two in the middle of the book of Philippians, we get one of those particular passages that just seems like, man, is that filler? But I want to encourage you with this. When you look at what's actually going on there, you're going to see that Paul, Timothy, and Epaphroditus are actually demonstrating with their lives what Paul wrote about just up ahead in chapter 2 when he's talking about being unified and being humbled as servants. We see in, we see in real life played out here in 19 through 30 how Paul's life, Timothy's life, Epaphroditus' life is given to unity in Christ and his servants poured out for him. We also see that as they're, as they're fulfilling the mission, that it's not easy, that it's hard. You're going to hear me say numerous times today that disciple making is messy and it's hard. And, and we're working out that salvation, the salvation that Jesus saves us and the love that he, we receive from him, we pour that out to other people. And it, at times it does get messy and it does get hard. But as we love with a supernatural love, Paul tells us that we shine like stars in the universe. And so when we read here at the end of chapter two, what Paul is giving us a window into is how they're actually living out what he's already written about. And, it, and it's quite instructive for us. Um, Part of the reason why it's instructive, well, let me back up before I get there. So for those of you that that don't know the whole picture and the whole story, uh, Paul is an apostle of Christ who is called to take the gospel to the other ends of the earth. And and he does that by going to different cities, eventually hoping to make it to Rome. And he plants churches everywhere he goes. He preaches and he teaches and he makes disciples. And he does that everywhere he goes. And that's what he did until his final last breath. Then we have Timothy. Timothy. Timothy was a young Greek who came to faith because of his mom and his grandma. Ladies, way to go. The disciple-making women are strong, and, and they were in, in Timothy's life. And so he first learned about the faith through them. But Paul took him under his wing, and he took him with him on the missionary journeys. And we'll see that even now with Paul in prison, Timothy's right there by, him, by his side. And what is Timothy doing? Timothy is doing what God designed him to do, which is to be a shepherd. And he is, he is shepherding Paul, and he's encouraging him, and he's pouring into him, and it's a blessing to Paul. But Timothy is also a shepherd to the other churches that him and Paul have visited and is, is, is a pastor of the church of Ephesus. Okay, And so there's a lot going on with Paul. There's a lot going on with Timothy. So who in the world's Epaphroditus? And why does that matter? Well, Epaphroditus was from the church at Philippi. He was one of the the people that came to know Christ and and was raised as a disciple. And his mission was to take supplies from the church at Philippi um, that they had all pitched in together to collect, to take it up to Paul so that Paul would be blessed and Paul would be encouraged so that the mission could continue. The other reason why they sent Epaphroditus up there is because they wanted Paul, they wanted Paul to send him Timothy. 
They're like, hey, here's your stuff. Can you send us Timothy? Because, man, he, he's awesome. And Paul's basically like, yeah, I know he's awesome. I don't want to cut him loose yet. Okay? And, and he tells them that I'm sure at some time the Lord will, send, will have me send Timothy to you. And I hope with the Lord's help, I will get there soon as well. So that's currently what's going on. Paul's in jail. Timothy's there shepherding him and encouraging him. And Epaphroditus has gone through a lot to get the message from the church of Philippi to, to Paul. And we're going to see some of those things in just a minute. But I want to focus on Paul for, for a minute. Paul is very singular focused in, in what his life is about. And his life is about the Great Commission. And it's about generational faithfulness. It's about making sure that the gospel goes from generation to generation to generation. And as, as Paul was focused on that, and as he lived his life with that, the stakes were high. Would the gospel spread? How would it spread? That seems like a, a, a mission that uh, is impossible. But we see that, that that was Paul's focus. And in that, the stakes were high. And so would the, gospel, would the gospel come to fruition? Would there be generational faithfulness? And what we find out is, yes, because God is faithful. You and I are sitting here today because of the faithfulness of men and women like Paul, like Timothy, like Epaphroditus, like the women who, who were discipling these churches. We're, we're here today because of that faithfulness. But our mission and our focus as a church, as a family of Christ right here at North Liberty, our focus is the same. Our whole church exists for the Great Commission, to love God with everything we have, to love others as ourselves, and in that, to go in to make disciples of all nations. And so you hear us often say, we exist to make disciples who make disciples. Even that phrase, we make disciples who make disciples, speaks to a generational faithfulness that we really aspire to here at Grace. And by God's faithfulness and with his help, we'll get better and better at that as we continue to uh, uh, keep our eyes on Jesus and walk in obedience to what he's called us to. But like Paul, our stakes are high today as well, maybe in a little bit of a different way. Our stakes are high today because when you live in a country and live in a culture who has worked hard to remove God, as you remove God, the country starts to look less and less like God. And so think about the generation that, the, that our kids are growing up into. Okay, and we've got a number of, of young adults and kids here today. They're growing up in a generation where generational faithfulness is not a thing. It's not valued. There's not even generational faithfulness in families. Due to the brokenness of sin and the focus on self, and, and as the world continues to teach us, hey, it's all about yourself and all about what you can get. The whole idea of, of generational faithfulness goes out the window. It almost reminds me of, of what we see the Israelites walking through back in the Old Testament in Genesis, not Genesis, in Judges chapter 2. Okay? The Israelites had made it to the promised land. Moses had died. Joshua had taken over. At the end of Joshua's life, he makes a big speech, and here's what he says. Choose you this day whom you will serve, but for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the whole nation of Israel started cheering. They started jumping up and down. They're like, yes, that's us. We'll do that too. Joshua dies, and you get two chapters into Judges, and here's what it says. There was a generation that grew up that didn't know God and loved God, and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And it was one of the darkest times in Israelites' history. And if we're not there as a country, we're close. Doesn't that sound like us? So the stakes are high. The gospel's got to continue down through the generations. And while the stakes are high, the opportunity is great. Because I honestly believe that this period of time in our history is an opportunity of a lifetime to love and to love well. 
What is our country and what is our society, our culture missing right now? Love. Can you imagine a people who goes out and loves others with the love that God gave us? And we're willing to just be servants and to walk in humility and to love others as Christ does? Don't think for a second that wouldn't be attractive. It is true, the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. So while it's a high stakes time, it's a time of the greatest opportunity ever for God's love to be displayed and to be demonstrated. And one thing I know for sure, God will be faithful. And he will use you and he will use me as long as, as long as we don't get tripped up with, with the obstacles that we're going to be looking at today. And so one of the things that I hope that we see today, and I got to catch up with my slides here, is that we learn from Paul and his friends that obstacles to equipping the next generation, they're really opportunities. Obstacles are really opportunities to see the faithfulness of the Lord. So we're going to talk about, yes, it's important today to equip the next generation. Who are the believers coming up behind us, both young and old? Who are going to be those next Christians? Who, are, who am I personally pouring into to demonstrate God's love to them? Who are you pouring into to demonstrate God's love and mercy to them? What will the next generations <clears throat> look like? Like in Paul's time, making disciples is incredibly messy because we hit obstacles, because um, we're, we're getting involved in, in people's lives, because we could be hurt physically and emotionally, because it takes time. It's an inconvenience. We have other things that we want to do with our time. And so discipleship looks messy. <clears throat> but we will see that God takes those obstacles, turns them into opportunities, and we see his faithfulness. And my hope is that by seeing the faithfulness of God, that we'll be encouraged and be more and more effective to, uh, to seeing future generations of disciple makers here at Grace. That's my prayer for you today is that you're encouraged. That yes, you see the obstacles. Yes, we deal with those obstacles. But you have a part to play in God's redemptive plan of history. You personally have a part to play. And we as a family have a part to play in that. And as we step out in humility and in courage to see God there, we will see his faithfulness in our individual life we will see his faithfulness in our corporate life in ways that we haven't. And that's what gets me excited, and that's what gets me encouraged, and I hope you get encouraged by that as well. So let's pray, and we're going to see the faithfulness of God in these obstacles. Lord, bless our time together in the Word. Thank you, Lord, that your Word is life. It's life-giving. Thank you for the examples that we have of Paul, Timothy, and Epaphroditus, and so many others throughout Scripture, Lord, that... Uh, forsook all for who f saw you as their ultimate treasure and uh, who, Lord, who gave their lives uh, to watch you be faithful to uh, lead them, guide them, and direct them so that generations throughout the, throughout the ages would know you and know the fame of your name. God, may that be true of us today. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Okay, so a question for you. And I want to ask, what would cause three guys like Paul, Timothy, and Epaphroditus to leave loved ones risking their lives for a mission that some may deem impossible? What caused them to do that? Because holy cow, we already know Paul's in jail. He suffered. If you know other parts of Paul's story, you know he goes through a lot more suffering. Timothy is suffering. Epaphroditus is suffering. What's causing these guys to do this? Boredom? How many of you would just pick up and do this because you're bored? You don't have anything else to do. When it could mean jail, when it could mean sickness, when it could mean leaving your loved ones. Boredom is probably not the reason why these guys are involved on this mission. Perhaps it's a challenge. Some of us in here, man, we, we're risk takers. And we like challenges like that. But just because you want to be a little bit challenged... Do you think you'd do this just for the sake of a little challenge? 
Probably not. Or you may start it, but you won't finish. Because at some point, what happens with the challenge? It costs too much. It gets too hard. So being bored isn't the motivation. Wanting a challenge can't be the motivation. What is the motivation? Treasure. Treasure's the motivation. Now, somebody told me today that there's some kind of backyard football game being played today somewhere. <clears throat> a couple guys getting together and going to rough it up in L.A. somewhere. Right? Just kidding. It's the biggest game of the, of, of the year, right? Think about, the, think about the Rams and think about the Bengals for a minute and the guys who are playing in that Super Bowl. When did the quest to become Super Bowl champions happen for them? When they were a little kid who watched it on TV. And they've gone after a treasure. And they've been given the ability to do that, physical ability and athletic ability to be able to do that. And for one team today, one of those teams is going to walk away with the treasure the other team's going to walk away bruised, beaten, and beat up without a treasure. But let's say, let's say, let's say uh, you're on the winning team and you get the Super Bowl trophy. How long is that going to be a treasure for you? Is it something you could put your hope in year after year after year? Well, man, when my life is going bad, when I'm depressed, when people around me have died, when relationships are broken, at least I got my Super Bowl trophy. The Super Bowl trophy isn't going to bring healing. Super Bowl trophy isn't going to bring provision. Super Bowl trophy isn't going to bring protection. And at some point in time, those players' names will be forgotten. But here's the thing we all live on mission. Hopefully, we're all living on, that, on the mission to, to know Christ and to know him more intimately. But there are times, if we're honest, where the missions that we're about on a daily basis are really about chasing temporary treasure. It shows up in our work. It shows up in our relationships. It shows up in what we pursue. And not that all of our pursuits are bad. There's a lot of good things in that. But as you've heard us say over and over again, what does that really look like, though, if, if the treasure is actually the temporal thing you're chasing rather than Christ is my treasure and I do these things because Christ is my treasure? So when we chase, <clears throat> chase temporal treasure, it never satisfies and it never provides. Hence, that's why we move from temporal treasure to temporal treasure to temporal treasure. It wasn't because of temporary treasure that Paul, Timothy, and Epaphroditus was on, they were on mission. No, it's because of an eternal treasure. Paul, Timothy, and Epaphroditus knew who their eternal treasure was. They not only knew him because that faith had been passed down to them, but they experienced everything that's true about the Lord. And how do we know that Christ was Paul's eternal treasure? Look at Philippians 3, 7 and 8. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Okay? Notice, whatever I gained I had, or whatever gain I had, whatever treasure I had, I counted as loss for the sake of knowing Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. There's a guy who's got his eye on an eternal treasure that's never going to rust, that's never going to go away. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What does Paul know about the Lord that it would be good for us to rehearse today? Because I think all of us need to remember who our eternal treasure is and why he's such a great treasure. Oftentimes we get burdened down with our sin and, and some of us 
struggled on a day-to-day basis with guilt and shame. And, and we wrestle with that. And today, just want the word to be, I want Jesus to be who he says he is, to be the lifter of your head. And so when I need my head lifted, when I'm on mission and I'm tired and I'm discouraged, I come back to who God is. I look at his character, I look at his actions, and I look at his promises. And so I just want to take a moment to rehearse those with you guys. So when we think about the Lord, we know he's eternal. We know he's holy. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing, and he's everywhere. God is just. God is love. God is merciful and abundantly gracious. God is wise. He's our provider. He's our redeemer. He is our savior. He is our rock. He is our fortress. He is our strength. Our God is near. He pursues you with a compassion when you're at your worst. He doesn't turn away and run. He moves towards you. What amazing grace that is. What good news that is. Are you starting to see why Paul sees him? Why Paul sees Jesus as the ultimate treasure? Nothing in this world can compare to that. And it's not just God's character, actions, and promises and being faithful to all of those things throughout the ages. It's also when we come to know Christ as our Lord and Savior, he gives us an identity and a purpose. The purpose is to join him on loving the whole world to know him and to glorify his name. But here is our identity. According to scripture, we are called children of God. We are called the redeemed. We are called forgiven. We are called conquerors. We're called ambassadors of Christ. We're called ministers of reconciliation. We're called the bride of Christ. And we're called loved. How amazing is that treasure? It makes me want to say what Paul says. I don't want anything this world has to offer. I want to know him more and more and more. I want to know him. I want to experience him. I want to tell everybody about him so they can experience him. And I want to join him in his suffering as well as join him in his victory. He is your eternal treasure. And he is faithful. This is what Paul, Timothy, and Epaphroditus lived and died for. It's to know Christ, to equip future generations. And we see the faithfulness of God in how he called them to himself, how he was with them on the mission, and how it was his faithfulness, his love, and his strength that got them through. So I want to talk about now Um, let's look at the obstacles that Paul and his friends were facing. Okay, there's three of them that, uh, that we can see. The first one that Paul faced, it's very obvious, is <clears throat> he was opposed by people. There were a lot of people that didn't want him preaching the good news. They saw him as a threat. They wanted it shut down. They wanted their kingdom They wanted to worship all kinds of other gods. People opposed Paul, put him in jail. Okay, Timothy. Timothy had to leave his mother and his grandmother and leave what he knew to join Paul on the mission. That could be an obstacle. Many of you who've had to move away from loved ones understand a little bit, some of that, where we miss our loved ones and we're not able to be with them. When God called me to ministry, my hope was that somehow we would end up in the Midwest. And, uh, and God put us in, uh, in St. Louis. We were there for 13 years. My family, my parents moved down. 
my sisters moved down. We had our kids. And then 13 years ago, I don't know what's up with the number 13, but uh, 13 years ago, God called us to Grace Community Church. And I knew, we knew that that's where God called us to be. And part of leaving was, was grieving the fact that we were going to leave family and friends in a, in a church that we love behind. But we know that God is faithful, and he has been faithful. And so I can understand that obstacle that Timothy was facing. Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus' circumstances where he was sick. Any of you try to work when you're sick? How well does your work day go? when you're feeling terrible, or when you're at school. Like the last place you want to be is at work, and the last place you want to be is at school, right? And you're just like, man, I just want to go hide in my room and, and just die and drink soup and not be bothered and all that fun stuff, right? Epaphroditus, while he was sick, took the messages that needed to be delivered from Philippi and took them to Paul and Timothy, and was sick even to the point of death. And Paul, Paul says in Philippians 2, 19 through 30, that even to, the, even to the point of death, but by God's mercy, he was healed. So what were the obstacles they were facing? Leaving loved ones, physical ailments, being, being, uh, having people against you, having circumstances where it's like, man, I don't see how we can move forward. It would be easy to hang your head and call it a day. But let's look at what happened. What did God do in those obstacles? When Paul was put in jail, he could have been done. I wouldn't want to sat on a dung-filled floor, would you? But guess what happened? Because Paul was so focused on his treasure and he's experiencing Christ and because of the faithfulness of God he just starts telling everybody in jail what he knows more importantly he starts telling them who he knows now everybody's getting saved God allowed Paul to be in jail why? because there was people there that needed to know Jesus there were people there that needed to go to heaven somebody has to get put in prison for that to happen and while he was in there he wrote letters letters that encouraged churches Letters that lifted their heads. Letters that spurred them on to a deeper love of Jesus. Those letters, this one was written to the church at Philippi, but it was also written to us. And here we are 2,000 years later being encouraged because of the fact that Paul had an obstacle in his life that kept him from the Great Commission. But that's where we see the faithfulness of God. Paul never stopped. He just used that occasion to keep on loving his treasure and to point other people towards that treasure. And we're here today because of that. Timothy left family, but gained a whole bunch of family that would never would have been his family before. And many people came into the kingdom. Epaphroditus, God saved his life on this side of heaven. Sometimes God saves our lives when we're sick on this side of heaven. And sometimes he takes us home and, and saves us that way if we know him. That's why Paul said, man, I would rather go home then be here. But if I'm here, it's because of God's purposes and plans in my life. So let's, let's go. So I want you to understand, you may be sitting here today and you're going through a lot of pain. Some of you I know have been opposed by loved ones, maybe even rejected. Some of you feel like you're in prison because you can, you're not allowed to share in your place of employment or you could get in trouble. And it seems like those things are stifling. But I just want to encourage you today. I want you to think about those circumstances that oppose you. Have they gotten you down? Have they caused you to lose sight of the treasure of him? If so, I want you to think about this. And I want you to pray about this. How is the Lord using those very things and those occasions for you to experience him more and to actually continue to make disciples. How is the Lord using those very things as occasions for you to experience him and to make more disciples? 
Do not let others or circumstances keep you from, from making disciples. We are conquerors. That's what we're called. He will be faithful to the generations. We win, guys. So don't be discouraged by your circumstances, but ask God to show you how do you continue to treasure him and walk by faith with him in the midst of your opposition. Does that make sense? Let's move on to the next one. Okay, the next one is a toughie for us because Paul's talking about Timothy. He's commending him there and he's talking about what an awesome shepherd's heart he has. Okay, and he goes, I want Timothy here. He goes, there's nobody that shepherds like Timothy. There's no one that cares about people more than Timothy. Everyone else is chasing after their own interests and not the interests of Jesus. Let's just stop there. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but, but I, we have to spend some time. Sometimes we're distracted by our own interests. It doesn't mean that the gospel doesn't continue on. It just means that I don't get to experience all the fullness of Christ. And I don't get to experience him working in me and through me. And in a lot of ways, I don't get to experience the Lord in a way that's going to impact my heart if I'm busy with my own interests. And so some of you young people, you know, right now, your interest is, man, I want to get through school. I want, to, I want to get my academics done. I want to have an awesome career. I want to play sports. I want to do this and I want to do that. I want to make sure I'm popular and we chase those things. And then as we do, we feel like, man, it's, I'm tired. This, this isn't plan, panning out the way I want it to. Why? Again, we're chasing our own interests. What if you continue to do school, still work towards your degree, still work towards your career, work towards sports or whatever else, or those of you who have careers, you continue to do your best there. Now it's not to grow up the corporate ladder. It's just to, to love God and to please him and to be a light and a demonstration of his love to everyone around you. When we begin to change our interests back to the interests of Christ, it may cause us to get rid of some of our interests because they shouldn't be there. It may cause us to think about the treasure of those interests that we seek. Does that make sense? So in a good way, I have a family. I have a wife, a beautiful wife that I've been married to for 28 years. We have five kids. Part of my job is to disciple my family. And, and because I'm discipling a big family and things like that, I can't just pick up tomorrow and go and, and be a missionary somewhere. I've got a lot of considerations. It would take a lot of time and a lot of planning. Some of you are here. You don't have those connections. And it's just like, well, I've been doing this and doing that for myself. And man, I really wish I had a purpose in life. You may be freed up to go tomorrow and to take the good news to wherever God calls you to do that. For some of you, it could be across the world. For some of you, it could be across the street. But I want to encourage us to think about are there interests that are keeping us from, being, from seeing our true treasure and for being excited and motivated to live out the mission that he's living out? Third, I want to go to uh, the last obstacle. The last obstacle is one that I hear about a lot uh, from you guys as I rub shoulders with you and involved in discipling with you. It's this one. I don't think I have enough talents and gifts and abilities or my limitations really hamper me. Dave, I'd really like to get involved, but man, my physical health, it's ailing. What can I do? My income is not there. I don't have any income. How could I serve without any income? I'm too young. Nobody's going to listen to what I have to say. I don't know how to speak. I'm too introverted. Satan pounds you day after day after day with your perceived limitations and perceived weaknesses. And at some point, you got to stand up and say, enough's enough. Notice, Paul was an apostle. He was given some great gifts to serve God with. He also had weaknesses. He did tell us over and over again, he wasn't a good speaker. He's not eloquent in his speech. We also know that he had a thorn in his flesh that God wouldn't take away. Now, why, why, why was Paul dealing with those limitations? Because God kept them there so that God would get the glory and that Paul and everyone else would see the faithfulness of God 
through not only Paul's strengths, but more importantly, through his limitations and his weaknesses. Timothy, okay, not an apostle, but he was a pastor. He had a shepherd's heart. Uh, he was commended for the type of gifts that he had. But he was also encouraged and challenged by Paul because he was young and oftentimes lacked confidence and he had a fear of man issue. But the great news was that didn't, those limitations didn't stop these guys. They trusted who God was and God used their strengths and their weaknesses to bring about his glory. Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus, man, he was sick. We already talked about that. But dude gets to Philippi and he's just a bumble of, of worried mess. Any of you feel like Epaphroditus? I spend most of my time worrying. Okay, and some of you in here, that might be the case. And we start worrying about stuff. What was Epaphroditus worried about? He was worried about his people. That the Philippians would be worried about him and he didn't want that. It's so much so, his worry was so bad, and Paul was getting freaked out. And Paul's like, dude, I don't want this dude to die. There's all, he's worried about them, they're worried about him. God healed him and Paul commends him sends him back as a soldier, brother, messenger, uh, warrior, back to Philippi, commended him. Even though there were strengths and weaknesses, he sent Epaphroditus back that ultimately would, be, would bring joy. So I don't know what weaknesses you feel like you have that are keeping you from engaging in the Great Commission and, and equipping the next generations, but we need all of, all of you. We need you to jump on board with your talents and your limitations and trust God with both and watch what he does when you step into his work. You'll be energized and your life will go in places with the Lord and your love for him that you could never imagine. Now, I've got to wrap this baby up. I've got exactly 42 seconds, okay? So our job at Grace is to equip you guys for the work ahead. Part of that equipping is to encourage you, and I hope that's what today has been, is to encourage you that yes, the road is hard, but God is faithful. Yes, there's opposition, but we have victory. Yes, you may have strengths and limitations, but God will use both of those in your life for his glory. Yes, we might need to change some uh, of our interests and stop chasing things that are temporal to chase things that are eternal. So at Grace, we're trying to equip, encourage you, and we're trying to equip you. We've planted the downtown church uh, some years back. We've planted a church at River City, in Riverside, uh, Solon. Uh, Grace Bell Plains, part of what we're doing. That's all designed to, to help make disciples. Last year, we went through a church reorg. Why? Because we wanted to get better at generational faithfulness. We wanted to get better at equipping the generations. So we went through a reorg to get better. Um, here in April, we're going to be going through a sermon series called BLESS. That's an acronym that's going to teach us how to have intentional relationships and how to love intentionally and to love well. Super excited about that. Everyone in the congregation is going to be encouraged and equipped in that. Um, the leaders in grace, the community group leaders, other leaders are already working through that, have been for half of 2021, um, because we've got a long way to go at, at continuing to learn how to love well. And uh, we want to be faithful in that. Also, starting March 5th and then going for three consecutive, not three consecutive weekends, but three consecutive months over a weekend. It's one weekend each month starting March 5th. We are holding a Soul Care Weekend Edition uh, Soul Care class that in those three weekends, you will be able to take Soul Care rather than taking it in a 20-week session that we offer in the fall and winter. We're doing that because we have more and more people that need to be equipped for our leaders, soul care is essential. It's mandatory. We make them take it because we believe that it's really going to help them and help us learn how to shepherd people using God's word so that we can care more and love better. And so we're super excited about that. Uh, if you're like, man, I'm really not sure how, I, how to do that, how to, how to shepherd and how to care for people, take the soul care class, register for it um, online, and uh, we'd love for you to do that. We also have a discipleship pathway and a leadership pipeline that have been developed that will help you take steps all along the way in your spiritual walk with Jesus. Starting here in the next month or two in 2022, you're going to be hearing more about this, we're starting a new elder development program to make sure that we're raising up leaders for all generations. 
So we're super excited about that. We're, we're challenged by that. The goal is, is to see more of, more of Christ. So that's what we're doing. What could you do? First start, here's an easy one. Begin by praying for two people specifically, by name, who need to know Christ's love and who need to become disciples who make disciples. Pray for them by name every single day. Second, think about getting in community group. Find biblical community to jump in and get involved in because it's there where you're rubbing shoulders with other brothers and sisters who will encourage you and point you in the right direction and where you can do that for them. It's a great place to join arms with us as we serve. Third, maybe, maybe put this as second, jump into an area to serve here at Grace. Um, other things that we're doing as far as equipping, we have a next-gen department, our children and our student ministries. They're just doing a great job. Men and women of all ages coming alongside, helping our youth. Um, we're very blessed to have them. We're very thankful for them. If you're in here and you're in the next-gen department, thank you very much. But if you're in here and you're a servant at all at Grace, thank you. Um, we can't begin to thank you enough for that because no matter what we're doing, whether it's serving coffee, holding a door, all of it gives us the opportunity to love God and to love others with his love. So if you're not serving, jump in and watch what God does with that. You'll be amazed. Okay? And for those of you that are here, you don't know Christ today. But you do know that chasing temporary treasures leads nowhere. And you know that you've made a mess of your life. I hope if you haven't heard anything else, you've heard today that you're loved by the creator of the universe, that before you were knit together in your mother's womb, he knew you and he ordained all the days of your life. And that he loves you and that he died and sent his son and died on the cross and rose again to save you from your sins so that you could have a relationship with him for eternity that doesn't fade away. It gets better and better and sweeter and sweeter. And so if you're here and you're like, man, I, I want to know Christ. I want to put my faith in him. Then I'd ask you to pray about that right now. Just say, God, forgive me. Help me to put my trust in you. Help me to start walking with you each and every day. And then fill out a card and put it on the information table so that we can know, so we can be praying for you and encouraging you. So we have a, we have a, a great purpose. We have a great mission, but we have a greater God. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for our time this morning. Father, we just pray that uh, your name would be glorified in our lives. Father, that with each of us, we would take that step that your spirit's calling us to take right now. And Father, may that be to help us love you more and love others, Lord, with just an unbelievable supernatural love that you give to us. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness in our lives. In your name, amen.